Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about working for peace in Africa. Our guest, Brenda Wanjiru, is based in Africa, where she works on peace education, peace activism, aiding children and refugees impacted by wars, and rehabilitating child soldiers. We will try to talk about all of these topics. Brenda Wanjiru, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David, for having me. Uh, thanks for coming on. Um, one of the projects you've been working on is called Silencing the Guns in the Continent of Africa. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? So Silencing the Guns is actually an initiative for the African Union. And what I've been trying to do is just create awareness on what the African Union has been doing with regards to silencing the guns. Initially, the project had started with silencing the physical guns, that's physically ending the wars and starting on peace building uh, with the countries that have been affected by war. But then being from a host, uh, a country that hosts refugees, it now sort of turned into, we noticed that there are more wars, especially mental wars, where refugees come in and just because you moved them from, say, the war-torn country into a peaceful country does not mean that, that part, the person who's coming in is in a peaceful state. And so we noticed, especially in the education system, many teachers were sort of complaining that the new students um, who were refugees were not really settled, if we may put it that way. So then because of community health workers, we were able to understand that, yes, physically they were in class, but mentally they were still at home in war. They still carried that trauma, they still carried that anxiety, you know, and whatnot. And so it also moved into the general society because you have neighbors who are staying with them and are witnessing the adults screaming, um, wetting themselves and whatnot because they have not left the war mentally. And so this trauma is coming in. And so that spilled over into mental health. When we got into COVID, we now had open spaces where we would watch online movies and it also spilled over into what people were experiencing during covid their mental health status and that now came into silencing the guns yeah. in, in many cases refugees are not well integrated into new societies they're kept separate mm -hmm. they're kept in camps and tents and so forth um how important is it to to make them part of the of the new place that they're living. Generally, when it comes to cultural orientation, particularly for the children, it is better for them to be included in the society because you also want them to have a sense of home, even though it is away from home. It may be a different culture, but children need stability which is very important for adults, maybe not so much because they can easily adapt into whatever society that they're in. But if children are not included in this um, setups, they end up remaining in that state they were when they first experienced the trauma. And so even though we understand the government's point of view when it comes to national security, in the long term, it may end up creating a situation of conflict cycle. So when we are talking about the importance of having them um, included in the society, we are looking into providing a sort of stable environment, first of all, whereby they can be able to first um, get healthcare, particularly for those who have been injured during the immigration uh, process coming from the Wotan country into the host country. We're also looking at provision of the right to education, you know, and you cannot get that when you put them into camps because in these camps you have a whole host of um, different characters, nationalities and whatnot. 
So if you put them into, if you let them remain into the camp, they now end up feeling that we're sort of from one prison into another and they end up shutting down. So then this creates another situation of, um, we could say lack of peace in the sense that you have crimes being um, committed because you have communities that do not understand each other, nationalities that don't understand each other. And so you avoid this when you put them into the host um, communities. Yeah. I think I can put it that way. The African Union is also emphasizing education this year, right? And you're working on, uh, on peace education? Mm-hmm. What are you so working when, on? Mm -hmm. Sorry, what are you working on? <laughs> so when we are talking about education this year, the focus that when the African Union said that this is going to be the year of education, they were not only focusing on education in the sense of being in class and having a teacher in front of you. It was also looking at civic education. It was also looking at, of course, the Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement, but also with regards to peace and security, we are also talking about the subliminal messages that we rarely see in most um, common media. So, for example, when we are talking about peace and education, we are looking at how do you speak to these refugees that are coming in, you know, um, whether as the healthcare personnel, immigration, government officials, how do you make them feel that they are now being welcomed in this specific society? To how are we also handling the border communities? You know, when we're talking about education, how are we also handling the border communities? Because most refugees are not just running away from conflict. Some of them are climate refugees, some of them are economic refugees who are coming in. And so with this education, how do you relate to people who may not necessarily look or speak like you? How do you incorporate their former um, education systems to yours without making them feel as if they're being discriminated? With regards to peace education, again, we are also looking at the communication that happens during the electioneering period. How are you talking to your constituents? How are you talking to the general um, citizenship in your country? Because you also realize that a lot of the civil wars are sparked by the language that is being used during that electioneering period. Because unfortunately, most of the times, politicians tend to pit two or more groups against each other. So when we're talking about education, we're looking at civic education. Do you understand why it is that you are voting? Do you understand your rights as a voter? Do you understand the process that is going to happen in case the person you're supporting loses, you know, so that it does not spill over into me versus them, turning into, you know, civil unrest, civil war, genocide, you know, in, in that aspect. So education is very broad, but at the end of the day, what each government is trying to do and the general African Union is trying to do, of course, I'm not speaking for them, but being um, a citizen of a member state is that, do you understand what is going on? Do you understand your role in this situation? Do you understand how to voice out your grievances when that period of time comes and do you understand how your words can be able to settle a dispute or start a dispute yes we're speaking with brenda wanjiru and you've also worked in the area of helping children who have been affected by war and and been traumatized, uh, which requires, I imagine, more than just a good education, right? Yes. What do what do these children need? Well, first and foremost, we need to understand um, the background of the society these children are coming from, and of course, the major 
services that are usually given to children who are coming into this host countries, of course, are healthcare uh, facilities, because you obviously want to ensure that they're coming in when they're healthy and safe and sound. And of course, provision of the basic needs as food, uh, shelter and water. But then now after that, we can start now with the DDR processes and that is de-characterizing this child from the war or the conflict zone transitioning into this peaceful, still and stable society. Now, given that this is a very expensive project because not only financially, but long-term, what most states are trying to do is to work together with um, health facilities, whether it is the AUCDC, which is the overall African, um, we could say health ministry, together with the host states. The first call of action, of course, after all this is providing um, psychosocial support. Now, usually that comes depending on the funding of the country. It may come in, in form of play therapy. And what play therapy is, is that we allow these children or teenagers, depending on the age that they have come into the country in, the opportunity to express their fears and whatnot in whatever avenue and space that they feel safe to. I know I have worked with um, courts at the coastal part of Kenya, and we did this when we were trying to talk to children who had been affected by terrorism or who were in the process of being recruited. And so they were saved. So we were trying to get information from them. And play therapy was a very great help because we were able, they used to draw pictures and you could see them drawing pictures of people holding machetes or guns. And at the same time in that picture, someone is holding money, you know, giving it to their parents. And so when we tried to relay this to the adults, they came out and they spoke about um, the 50-50 situations they're in, the decisions that they had to make because here you are in a situation where someone is coming to you and saying we'll pay your children's school fees up to probably university if you let one of them come and so they talk about how difficult it is to make decisions when you're provided such um, options because on one hand they need to be serious you want your child to go to school, you want them to get the best education. But on the other hand, you're giving out a child who you're probably never going to see again. And if they come back, they're coming back as a different person. So trauma therapy is one of the major avenues that most countries are using when it comes to assisting children affected by conflict. Also because there is also the fear um, I would say fear, although we are seeing it in real time, we tend to forget adults who were once children affected by conflict. And so these adults are now very huge participants in the conflict cycle in Africa. If we may unfortunately quote uh, South Sudan, they are now in a generational point of recruitment. You know, you're having those who fought in the former Sudan you have children who fought during this liberation of um, you know, Sudan and South Sudan. You have children who were in the new South Sudan who are now trying to fight for a better Sudan. And then you're having children who are now being born in the Sudan. And so how are you going to assist those children who are now adults up to the ones who are being born right now? And so even though we're talking about assistance, um, rehabilitation and reintegration of former child soldiers, I would like to put it out there that it is a very expensive project, mainly because it is long-term. However, there have been success in some way. We cannot refute that there's been success. And I think the greatest one is Ishmael Bear's story for those who've been able to read his book. Um, a long way gone. I tend to use whenever I'm teaching, I tend to compare, when I'm comparing rehabilitation and reintegration of former child soldiers, I tend to use him and South Sudan's um, Emmanuel Jal, his book War Child, on the differences between rehabilitation and just taking a child straight from war to school. 
that is a very good benchmark because with Ishmael Bear, you can see that um, cultural orientation, rehabilitation and reintegration has turned him into, we could say, a better person in the society. Whereas for Emmanuel Jal, he went straight from war to class. And he's talked about how sometimes he still feels um, the trauma and the fear and the anxiety from war. So uh, just to finish that part, the African Union has a platform on children affected by conflict to which I am an honorary member. And we had visited um, Sierra Leone to try and talk about the inclusion of education in peace building because as we can see today, Sierra Leone and Liberia are dealing with Kush, which has now been seen as an epidemic. And Sierra Leone's government also stated that um, sexual abuse has become so high, you know, in their country that they stated it to be a national crisis. But when you're talking to the people themselves, you have some of the men coming out and saying that I've always known that this has been the life you know, and when you go back to their history, you also realize that they, these are adults who participated in war. It's a lot. <laughs> Let me just pause. There. It's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> you know, you, you say that you say that rehabilitating children who've been recruited into war is very expensive. And I and I'm sure you're right. Mm -hmm. But I never really believe anything is very expensive compared to wars, uh, because I see how much money goes into wars. And, and even some of the wars in Africa involve <laughs> troops that have been trained by militaries from other wealthy countries, including the one I'm in, the United States. And weapons, almost no weapons are manufactured in Africa. They come in from elsewhere is a huge investment, hugely expensive uh, to provide all of this weaponry. Uh, I, I have to assume if the world were, were turning away from the weapons trade and focusing on education globally, it wouldn't seem quite as expensive as it does, would it? It's... Um... I will be honest with you, you can never have the same answer to that specific question that you have, particularly because every sector has its own answer. So what I can react to that is what I have seen in the field. And one of the, I could say one of the biggest backstabbers would be the people who really do not want peace to continue. And of course, it's because of those people who are benefiting from the war. Of course, um, unfortunately, to mention the DRC and also with the civil war in Sierra Leone, we could see that there were are there were individuals who were really benefiting from this war. They were making money out of it. They end up um, sending their children outside the continent to get a better education and whatnot. And so when you're coming in with this conversation that we need the whole society to benefit, they have, by the time you're bringing this conversation to the table, they have the connections, they have the finances to stop you. You know, that is one aspect. Two, from that same um, line of thought, you also have subjects under this people who have also been benefiting from this and will go to the extreme to silence those around them. I think for all of us who've studied um, colonialism, very prevalent in our education in the continent, you are noticing that for all the founding fathers in each state, they were silenced by those close to them. But when you go a step further, you realize that it is the greed of this person who was used um, that affected this whole narrative and situation of Africa actually becoming a better society. And so at the end of the day, truth be told, is that we are the only ones who can change our continent. But the thing is, if we want to, and so that's 
how you're now seeing the situation in Nigeria, whereby youth are now coming out and saying that we are tired of the way we are being governed. But you're also seeing a section of youth also coming out and saying we're okay with the way situations are. And so it is true the West has a very huge role, um, has played a very huge role with the destabilization of Africa, but we also need to come to the table and admit that we also have the power to change our continent. Um, not to brag, but I think my country, Kenya, has done a very good job <laughs> with the protest. And you can see just how coming together makes it easier to change your own society. But even if we are the benchmark for the whole continent, we also cannot do it for everyone else. You must also have that conversation and you must agree within yourself that we want this change and we're willing to go for it for us to now collectively come and say that this needs to stop. Well, you can never get a straight answer out of what you have asked. It is complex. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> this, this may be very complex as well, but it, it seems is. to me when you're, when you're dealing with education, an important part of it is, is history. Um, in, in my country, history is taught as if there have always been wars, nothing has been accomplished without wars, nonviolent activism has never done anything, diplomacy hardly exists. Uh, it, it seems important for people to be taught history correctly, uh, including recent history. Um, or they don't understand how they how they got to be where they are and, and what's happened in the world and, and what might change it for the better or what other countries might learn from from Kenya or vice versa. Um, how how important is is the teaching of history? It's the most important, of course. I mean, it's you cannot know where you're going until you know where you came from. But this conversation has also, and the implementation of true history, true African history has also been hit with a lot of setbacks. Um, I think for the last five years, various African countries have wanted to receive back their artifacts. But you are having these states that stole this artifacts sing it to your face. You cannot have these artifacts. They're ours. If you want your artifacts, you have to loan them. And so you're now having law societies in the continent coming in and saying, you cannot loan to us what is ours. You know, yeah. we saw that with DRC trying to get back its artifacts. We saw that with Ghana trying to get back its artifacts. And of course, it is a well-known fact that the British um, museum has a lot of artifacts that does not belong to its own country. And so as we're talking about history, yes, we know where we're coming from. Yes, we have these books that are telling us where we're from. Now, how do we go from there? You know, because a lot of the times the information is in front of us. I think for us, we learned in high school, um, I am not really good at Marvel movies, but I'm trying to remember the name of this lady um, with the shield. I just know she's a lady with a shield. But we learned in history that it is actually a background of the Dahomey Amazons who actually won the war against the French. And this is the is... Wonder Woman superhero, Wonder Woman. It should, yeah, it should be her. It should be her. <laughs> it should, it should be her. I just know she's um from Marvel, I don't watch, okay. <laughs> but um, I know the inspiration was from the Dahomey Amazons. And so when we're talking about history, are we ready to go that deep? Because the information is out there, there are books out there. I always recommend people to go to the site forgottenbooks.com. You will learn a lot. It may be too much to handle, but the information is there, not only with regards to education in the classroom, but also in healthcare. 
it is a well-known fact that, um, oh my goodness, if I say this, I cannot for the life of me remember the article, but um, the a lot of African practices with regards to medicine and healing and whatnot, like they're known, they're still practiced to date. So as we're talking about modern healthcare, are you also willing to accommodate the fact that there is a society, there is a group of people, there is a race of people that knew more than you did? So history is not just about teaching at in class, but are other groups also ready to accept that? We're seeing that in sports, you know, whereby you're having sportsmen coming in and saying that we discovered this, we are teaching this, but we have societies that have been doing that for generations to come. So it's not just about teaching history. How is it going to be received in the world? And how far are you willing to go to defend your history? Yeah. Very good question. Uh, we have about three minutes left. What do you what do you want people to know the most? And 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 how can people contact you and follow what you're working on? You could find me on LinkedIn. My name is Brenda Onjiru. Um, I believe the second spelling will be able to be found when this goes up. But other than that, I I really want people to look at their mental health and understand that some of the decisions that they are making today as adults are as a result of what happened in childhood and that we should not be quick to just follow narratives that we are seeing online and on normal media about certain countries. We also need to go back and look and answer, and answer the question, how did they get here? Because not everything that you see in the TV is what is actually happening. A lot of narratives are silenced. Yes. Well, a lot is left out <laughs> I think, uh, from what is allowed uh, or put onto people's television. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have been speaking with Brenda Wanjiru and she is working in Africa on peace education and aiding children and aiding refugees. And we will have links up to your LinkedIn page uh, and anywhere else we can link to at talkworldradio.org. Um, Brenda, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, for hosting me. <laughs> this is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.